Welcome to the Community Living Education Project's Sharing Possibilities for Community Connections Learning event. The Rutgers Community Living Education Project, also known as CLEP, is a program through Rutgers School of Public Health. CLEP is committed to providing individual guidance, mentoring, and education surrounding community living resources for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. The CLEP team can serve as a bridge for advocates and families whose loved ones are ready to explore residential options outside of the family's home. We are happy you are joining us for today's webinar, Person-Centered Life Planning, Securing the Future for People with Disabilities. Today's session is being presented by Jason Miller, representing Planned Lifetime Assistance Network of New Jersey, also known as Plan New Jersey. To ensure the highest sound quality possible, all attendees will be muted during today's event. We like to keep these sessions interactive. So to ask a question to the presenter or host, please use the Q&A option on your screen. If you would like to be unmuted to ask your question live, please just send a message to me, Melanie McGacken, using the chat feature, and we will make sure to unmute your microphone during your turn. Topic-specific questions will be addressed as long as time allows, and for consideration to all of our attendees, we encourage you to keep questions as general as possible. At this time, I would like to welcome today's presenter, Mr. Jason Miller. Jason, welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, just a couple of housekeeping issues. Um, you know, we're going to take a couple of breaks to, to review questions and, and manage that piece. Um, what I'd like to say is that if possible, if we could avoid sending, when we do have questions, if we could avoid sending them to everyone, and if you could send them to Melanie McGacken, just so this way they get directed to her, and then we're going we're gonna to bring down the, the slides and um, we're going to do some, some live Q&A uh, halfway through the presentation. And then again, at the end, whatever time permits, we will, uh, we'll of course, try and answer every question that we get. Um, but if something comes up that you want to, you know, get it off your mind, just please make sure that you send it to Melanie. So this way it doesn't come up on the, the screen for everyone, um, as it could be kind of distracting. So that said, um, my name is Jason Miller. I'm the Director of Service, Social Services at Plan New Jersey. Um, Plan New Jersey is an organization that's been around for about 25 years. Um, we have been serving as legal guardian for individuals. We also provide services such as trust administration, home visit monitoring, representative payeeship, um, and, and general advocacy for clients with disabilities. So that could mean individuals with developmental disabilities, mental health issues, or uh, physical disabilities. So when we talk about what we're going to cover today, um, mostly what we're going to be looking at is uh, the, the process of life planning. So um, when we talk about life planning, we're talking about securing a good life. Um, to do that, we have to account for a lot of different areas in, in a person's life. So, you know, the, the, the broader spectrum of things, we have the legal area, uh, the financial area, and home and community. Um, and then there's certain little nuances in there that, that we're going to get detail on to make sure that, you know, we're covering all and encapsulating that person um, in their entirety. So um, we're also going to talk about guardianship um, and alternatives to guardianship. A lot of folks out there think that you're either the guardian or, the, or you're not. And if you're not guardian, you don't have any ability to, to oversee an individual's care. Uh, so we're going to address that issue. We're also going to talk about special needs trusts, um, which is a financial vehicle to help manage your ability to leave behind some assets to your child um, in a way that does not jeopardize their public benefits. And then finally, we're going to talk a little bit about ABLE accounts, which is a, a relatively new um, authorized account type by the federal government and then recently legislated by New Jersey uh, that allows an individual that is on means-tested benefits, um, which would be Social Security or Medicaid, um, the, it allows them to provide a little bit of savings for themselves to perhaps save for a vacation or, or other things related to um, disability needs. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then, like I said, we're going to we're going to try and um, answer as many questions as we possibly can today. OK. All right. Um, again, Plan New Jersey. So we've, we've been around for, for quite some time. Um, really, our origins came from uh, families much like the, the folks that gathered here today. Um, it's a number of families back in the back in the 1980s wondering 
well, I do all these things as a parent. Um, you know, maybe there's some place to, to live and, and some place to work. Um, well, who's going to take care of that coordination of care only like a parent can do? Um, so, so with that in mind, they were the initial creators of, of the purpose and scope of Plan New Jersey, which was who will care for my loved one while I'm gone. You know, it's, it's not a problem for every family, but it's a problem for enough families that they don't have enough people that, that can play an active role in, a, in an individual's life to, to provide the necessary support. So as I was saying, these are all the different types of things that, that Plan New Jersey can do. Um, we can serve as trustee, um, you know, we serve as guardian. You know, one of the other unique roles that we serve is, um, is supporting a family guardian. So, you know, that is exactly what, how it sounds. So sometimes we have a situation where, you know, uh, there's two children, um, one has some support needs, the other is maybe neurotypical. You know, they go off to college and maybe move out to the West Coast because that's where their life carried them. And, and what, you know, really family support is, is, you know, providing that representation in state and, and nearby to the individual. And then we can report back to that family, uh, that family member. So it allows them to not have necessarily the burden of taking care of all those, those details of, of supporting an individual in the state of New Jersey, but it still allows them to continue to, to maintain that, that, family, that family role and that family decision maker role. Uh, we also serve as representative payee for, for our clients that, that we're either guardian or trustee for. We don't offer that to the community at large just because it's, it's a very, very large job and it's, it's a very high need position. So, you know, we do just spend a lot of time advocating for, you know, more representative pays for social security. But, but at this time we're, we're only servicing our clients that are, are under the auspices of our care. Um, we do a lot of life planning and we're going to talk about what that, what that really means today. And we're going to get into the nitty gritty of what, what creating an effective life plan is. And then within the scope of guardianship or home visit monitoring, um, you know, the, the, the case management piece is, is making sure that an individual is visited on a very regular interval. Um, typically speaking, when we're, we're talking about our clients, it's typically at least monthly. Sometimes it's every other week. Sometimes it's weekly. Um, but, but at the very least, you know, especially when it's a guardian client, it's at least monthly visits. Um, you know, providing that coordination of care. Who's going to remember that it's time for the doctor? Um, those, those details that, you know, maybe mom and dad only know or are only really particularly paying attention to. And, you know, and then we have the, uh, you know, the, the benefits management piece, which is one of the more difficult things, which is one of the more difficult things um, in terms of, um, it's one of the more difficult things in terms of how individuals can um, manage correspondence that's coming in from the, the federal government or the state government to, to ensure that those benefits are there. So let's talk about life planning. Okay. Um, when we talk about life planning, we're, what, we're, what we're really trying to create is, is a very specific description of what an individual may need. Um, you know, it could be, you know, what their likes and dislikes are, um, where they shop, where they, you know, spend their time, where do they work, you know, all of those things and, and creating that, that repository of information for an individual that creates basically, um, it basically creates a situation where you, you as a caregiver has, have a manual to work with an individual and know what those needs are. So a lot of what we do is working with families in, in the short term. By working with the families in the short term, it allows us to get all of that information in advance. So then so the information is there already. And then when, when something happens to those parents, it, it's not something that, you know, we have to search for, for that information. Um, making sure that we have the resources that are there. Where does a person live? What, what is the best situation for a person? Um, you know, what, what kind of resources is an individual going to have? You know, how much, what, how much money are they getting in Social Security? Who's managing those? Who's going to serve as special needs trust administrator? You know, and, and that's a big part of this planning, which is to ensure that you have people in those legal roles. So your successor guardian, your power of attorney or healthcare proxy, which we're going to get into, um, that's the legal role. That's, that's what level of support does a decision, does, does a person making a decision uh, have? Uh, financial roles, trustee, representative payee, enable account manager, 
you know, a budget coach, somebody that's going to help. So, so part of this, once you're identifying the specific needs that an individual has, it's then going beyond that and, and determining who is going to fit into that role to provide that support. Um, the home community support. So who's going to ensure that that doctor is taken care of that, you know, any follow up, you know, whatever, however minor they may be, or, you know, or just ensuring that those, those individual, that individual actually gets that follow-up care that's necessary. You know, we go to the doctor all the time and they say, oh, well, you have to follow up with this doctor. So it's, it's making sure that an individual has that direct oversight to ensure that, you know, that they're getting the, the health care that they need. Okay. So this is one of my favorite slides just because what it talks about, and we actually had our staff do this, um, you know, as part of, part of one of our trainings. Um, and what this is, is this, this talks about how, you know, when you're mapping out who these roles are, you, you have two distinctive categories, you know, who, who's going to care about someone and who's going to care for someone. Care for someone, you know, really is indicative of your, your uh, direct service providers, maybe a, a residential care staff or, or day program staff, um, you know, who's going to, you know, these are, this would be probably your support coordinators, you know, these are, these are the areas for an individual that, you know, they're, they're have a lot more hands-on pieces to make sure that that individual is successful on a day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week basis. And then you have, you know, who's going to be in the, in the role of caring about, which is, you know, making sure that, you know, somebody remembers their birthday and, you know, comes and visits them, you know, to make sure that they, you know, have, you know, kind of that family component of, of ensuring that that individual, you know, knows that people care about them outside of their direct service providers. You know, who's going to keep track of the information because the individual, while they may be cared for in, in, in an individual agency, those things have a tendency to change. So maybe, I'll, you know, if we said John, John's in, in this day program today, he may, you know, that, that may change in the future. So who's going to be that really continuity in that person's life and, and know the stories. And part of that, that knowing all the stories is directly related to, you know, utilizing the primary reporter as parents or, or sibling to get that information on paper. So that repository of information lives beyond those parents. Okay. Um, this is another one that I really like. Um, this, you know, in this in this case, we have Connor. Um, these basically, it's it's called a star map, and you know, in 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 essence, what this does is this kind of talks about all the different areas that are important in Connor's life. So, you know, looking at Connor's strengths, he likes making friends, he likes to laugh, he likes to learn. You know, he's smart, he's funny, um, and then you look at his relationships. You know, who are the important relationships in his life? Mom, Dad, Lily, Peyton. Um, and, and that, those are the people that, you know, he relies on, you know, to, to help his world. And then you have technology, you know, what are the things that, what are the technology pieces that help him with success? You know, his iPad, his cell phone, that keeps him connected. Um, he likes video games. So that's important to him as well. And then you have your community supports, which are activities that he's involved in Lego club and YMCA camps. And then, and then the eligibility, which is, which is really the, the benefits management. You know, he's got Medicaid, he's self-directed, um, and he's got challenges. So he, he likes sports, he's got SSI. So these are all the programs that, that he fits into that, you know, help support his life. And then finally, as far as for life planning, um, this one is great too. Um, what this does is this helps us really resolve a couple pieces. You know, when we talk about planning, you know, okay, I have these goals, I have, you know, these people in those legal support roles. And what this really helps us focus in on is, is what do you want? What's your, what's your goal? You know, what are the things that you want that you would consider to be a good life versus what do you not want? You know, when, when people talk about, you know, this situation, um, when they talk about, you know, the, you know, just their, their general life planning, you know, a lot of families are, are very against group homes and other, other families are very not against, you know, very, very uh, pro group home, you know, so, you know, a lot of this helps identify a lot of different issues that come up um, in the planning process and, and mostly putting an eye on what do we want, what do we envision that life to look like later on, you know, what are, what are, what, what are we doing to try and get to that piece, okay, so these are included in your slides, um, you know, I highly encourage you to take a look at them in a little bit more detail than, than, you know, time permits us today. Um, but what I would say is, is take the time to go through those because 
they're they're very eye opening in in terms of trying to figure out where you're where you're heavy on supports and where maybe you need need a little bit you know a little bit of a additional focus on to to make sure that you know that that the individual has all of those areas covered um, throughout the planning process. All right, so so when we talk about planning, um, it's it's hard to not talk about this issue, which is guardianship. So. Um, Regardless of where you stand, whether whether you agree with the idea of guardianship or not, um, the reality is is in the state of New Jersey we have what's called a limited guardianship law. Okay, um, so I'm going to take you through what what that looks like and and how guardianship is attained. Um, so when a child turns 18 at 12:01 a.m. on their 18th birthday, they become their own legal guardian, and I know that freaks a lot of parents out. So we'll start with that issue. Um, there is nothing that happens at 12.01 a.m. on their birthday that necessitates you to have a guardian by 12.02 a.m. Um, in the rare instance that an individual, you know, is going to be their own guardian for a period of time, that's really okay. Um, you know, if, if something were to happen during that time frame of, you know, their 18th birthday and when a court date has been gotten to adjudicate that matter, there's always the ability to go and get a temporary guardianship as needed. Um, and that could mean if somebody had a medical issue going on and you needed to assert yourself as the parent, but the person had a cognitive disability and, and was pretty clear and convincing that they needed a guardian, you could get a temporary guardianship. But assuming under normal circumstances that there's no emergency, um, 12.01 a.m. on the 18th birthday, um, we'll just use John. John becomes his own legal guardian. Um, Let's say John has a cognitive disability. Um, he does not have the ability to govern his own affairs. So what has to happen is, is the parents have to petition for guardianship. So this is plays out in the surrogate court, surrogate section of the court. So there's the criminal court, family court, um, civil court, and you know there is the surrogate court, which handles um, wills, trusts, probate, you know of those things. But they also handle adult guardianships. So in essence. Like any other court case, when you're petitioning for someone that petitioning that someone is is incapacitated, um, effectively what happens is is you're alleging that person is incapacitated, and then it's your obligation to prove to a judge that that person cannot govern their own affairs. And when we say prove, it's evidence like any other matter in court. You would get evaluations, and in the state of New Jersey, you need two. Um, you can use your primary care doctor because that's somebody that knows you know John very well. Um, but you also would need a, an additional physician to, you know, complete an affidavit to ensure that, that individual needs a legal guardian. Um, so that could be a psychologist, it could be a neurologist, it could be, you know, a, a psychiatrist. Um, you know, it can't be a podiatrist or somebody that doesn't have any specific knowledge of the brain. But in essence, you know, if you have that evidence, you would provide that, you know, within your petition to a judge, and a judge would make a determination on whether an individual needs a guardian, okay, at what level do they need a guardian, and then finally, who that guardian should be. So when we talk about limited guardianship, what that means is, is that a, a judge is really held to the standard of you should only be, be, be giving an individual a guardian for which areas they need. So a long time ago, it used to be plenary. You either had a guardian or you didn't have it, or you either have one or you do not. Um, and what that was called was plenary guardianship. Now, under the limited guardianship law, we have a, a, a thing called guardian of the person, guardian of the property, or both, right? So both being that plenary means that an individual needs help in, you know, medical, financial, legal, and then property, meaning that they need help with their finances, okay? So now, you know, even within that, a judge is supposed to carve out. So let's say an individual may be able to manage their social security benefits, the judge would actually spell that out in the order. So it gets very, very specific. Um, I don't know that I can go into all the details, but it, it gets very specific on what an individual may have guardianship for in those cases that are kind of iffy, where an individual does have some skills and abilities to manage certain areas, um, but, but maybe not others. Um, so after you provide that evidence to a judge, a judge renders his decision and then once that decision is made, let's say that let's say that John needs a legal guardian, 
okay, and mom or dad or both, let's say both mom and dad are appointed as legal guardian, they're going to get a certificate, um, looks very similar to a birth certificate, it's got a raised seal on it, and then it outlines the date at which you became appointed guardian, um, as well as um, any other details that might be on there. Um, sometimes they have a successor written right on the, um, the guardianship certificate, but other times not, um, because ultimately, you know, it's up to that current guardian to select a successor guardian, and that's typically done through the will. So duties of the responsibilities, duties and responsibilities of guardian. First one is, is identify who would be a successor guardian. So in the case of a mom or a dad that both become guardian, if something happens to mom, dad's going to become the guardian and vice versa. Okay. But beyond them. So, you know, you need to have selected someone because if something happens to both mom and dad, the individual John still needs a guardian. And that's still going to be recognized. So what happens is if you don't make that plan, what's going to happen is, is, is somebody else is going to make that decision for you. So I highly recommend that, that if you're in a situation where guardianship applies, it's important that you select that guardian to, to help decide who's going to be the next driving force in your child's life. And, you know, ultimately, when I say pick one, what I mean is pick at least two. And then if you pick two, if you can pick two more. And the reason why I say that is because once you get to the end of the list and we don't know what happens in other people's lives, once you get to the end of the list, John still needs a guardian. So if there's nobody else on that list, you're, you've effectively exhausted your decision-making ability of selection. And therefore, a judge is going to make that determination, usually with the help of a, a guardian ad litem, which is oftentimes an attorney. So it's one of those things that you want to pay attention to when you become a legal guardian. Beyond that, the other duties are visiting on a regular basis. Statute in the state of New Jersey says that you have to visit at least on a quarterly basis, okay? And, you know, when it comes to our guardianship services, we, we, we go more frequently than that. So we're, we're of the philosophy that, you know, you have to visit at, at minimum on a monthly basis to really be able to help and guide somebody with decision-making. Um, but the statute says four times per year. Um, which is often helpful for, for out-of-state family guardians, um, with one caveat, you know, uh, kind of trending in, in that direction. Um, a, lot of, a lot of judges are, you know, hesitant to provide to appoint a, an out-of-state guardian unless they have a mechanism within the state that allows somebody to make more frequent personal visits, because it's very hard for a judge to say, you're looking after this individual, but you live four states away. Um, so how, from a practical basis, could you be there to, to support that individual when they need it? Um, so we do work up with a lot of relationships with family members for that as well, um, because we can satisfy that that requirement for um, for the judge. Um, annual reporting to the court. So um, if there are any current guardians in this in this seminar, you know, mom and dad, they don't typically, you know, rant and rave if mom and dad don't send the annual reports. But once that guardianship passes beyond you, um, more than likely they're going to be expecting those reports on an annual basis you know, within the month of the uh, appointed date. So if, you're, if your case was heard in September, you know, there's an annual report due every September for the life of that individual. Um, you know, promoting self-determination. So, you know, I, I like to use the term, you shouldn't guardian with a hammer. So guardianship is not do as I say, because well, that's what I think the best decision is. Um, guardianship is soliciting, you know, what the individual wants and breaking down the barriers to make sure that that individual can get to where they want to. Um, that's really the essence of what supporting an individual is. It's, it's really to protect them from, you know, in their vulnerable status um, with whatever their limitations are and, and prevent harm from coming to them, not to have them do what you want them to do or, or puppeteer their life. You know, the objective here is to really find out what they want, you know, and then as long as it's reasonable, help break down those barriers to make sure that they can go get it. All right. And then, you know, we, we put this in here because it's important, um, you know, and this mostly applies to a lot of folks in the, in the traumatic brain injury community. Um, usually developmental disabilities are, are, are persistent, um, as is mental health. So, you know, it's, it's not a frequent occurrence um, where, where people do get um, a revocation, which really is, you know, is really a, what's called a return to capacity. Um, and what that means is that they no longer meet the criteria for guardianship anymore, meaning they can govern their own affairs. Um, and that's actually done with the same piece, the same uh, effect that getting a guardianship in the first place. So you would need additional um, affidavits and physicians to evaluate the individual. 
Um, basically, John would have to go and, you know, meet at least two doctors to come and, you know, to so they can report that he has the abilities and, and to govern his own affairs. Um, so they would have to test him and, you know, provide that evaluation to the court. And then that that those affidavits would be the evidence for that return to capacity. Um, and it is the, the guardian's responsibility if they feel that the individual is no longer in need of a guardianship to help them through that process to, you know, to, again, break down those barriers if it's appropriate. Okay. So um, alternatives to guardianship. So when we talk about guardianship if we, on a scale of, of restrictiveness, guardianship, plenary guardianship would be the most restrictive oversight that you can have from an individual. What that means is you're taking away rights. Um, and it's not, it's not all bad um, by any stretch of imagination. In fact, it's, it's quite good in, in terms of, you know, the ability to protect an individual. Um, you know, I don't know, my mail comes at five o'clock today. I'm going to go out to my mailbox and I'm going to have four credit card applications, maybe two cell phone applications, um, lots of different things that are, you know, predatory type mail coming to my mailbox. If I were to fill out that application, I can go get a credit card. I can potentially get a high credit limit and spend those funds. The difference being is, is that it's my responsibility as my own legal guardian to ensure that I'm not, you know, getting off budget or, or doing those things. However, an individual living out in the community that does have a legal guardian, they could have that same situation happen. They could sign up, get a credit card, and go out and spend money that's well beyond their means to repay. And when you have a legal guardian, that is something that you're not responsible for because those, whether it's a credit card agreement, a cell phone, um, whatever the case may be, it's a legally binding contract. And that's what that level of protection of guardianship of the property provides. It, it keeps you from having the ability to enter into a legally binding contract without the supervision of someone else. Um, you know, it's extremely important. And I, and I, I know that sounds like a very far-fetched idea, but I've dealt with it countless times before. Um, I had at one point, I had an individual who had signed up for five cell phone plans, got five cell phones. This is in the days when they used to give them to you for free, but they signed up for five cell phone plans. They obviously don't need five cell phone plans. And when I reached out to them, I, I kindly explained that, you know, unfortunately, this person has a legal guardian and they're like, well, they still owe the money on the bill. And I explained to them, no, they don't because they can't enter into a legally binding contract and I need to speak to your legal department. And when I had this conversation with the legal department, I asked them, is there any way you can flag them in the system so this, this doesn't happen again? We don't, we don't think you should send us cell phones and, and they don't have to pay for them. And they said, no, it's a highly competitive market and we're going to continue to do that. That's the best way we reach our customers. And so, it, you know, it's one of those things that even despite having a reasonable conversation with corporate America, if you will, there's still always going to be that potential for, you know, an individual to continue to, to, to do that. And the same thing has happened with credit cards. Um, same story just with, you know, Visa and MasterCard. Um, so there are real pitfalls out there for, for someone. Um, and that's why guardianship is important. Um, and they're also something that power of attorney and healthcare proxy don't offer. So when we talk about alternatives, you know, for individuals that maybe don't need a legal guardian, you know, there are other options. So power of attorney or healthcare proxy, which are kind of similar. Um, power of attorney will deal, could deal with personal issues, but also with financial issues, whereas a healthcare proxy is specific to, um, you know, to healthcare related decision making. Um, so, so in essence, what, what you're doing and, and the major difference between the power of attorney and healthcare proxy versus a guardianship is, is these are both verbally revocable, meaning that you could be power of attorney today, but if the individual says, I don't want you to be my power of attorney anymore, then you're no longer that power of attorney. The other piece of, of power of attorney is it does not allow, I mean, there's a lot of people think that, you know, as power of attorney, you have the ability to act, you know, and make decisions on behalf of a person. And, and really you don't. What, it, what it's creating is your ability to act also as well as the individual. So, so um, John may be able to open up a bank account and you as power of attorney may also be able to open up a bank account, but a power of attorney does not allow you to necessarily, you know, utilize funds in John's account. You know, if, if he's incapacitated, like in a coma, then that power of attorney allows you to act on John's behalf. But under normal circumstances, John has a right to, you know, to, to dictate what his wishes are. Okay. Um, you know, the, the benefit of it is, is that you don't have to go through a long core process. 
to complete it. It's something that can be done in an afternoon in an attorney's office. You're signing in the presence of a notary, all the items that are outlined in the power of attorney. And I don't want to give the impression that it's a useless document because it's not. It's, it's very helpful, especially when you're dealing with insurers, um, hospitals. They all recognize these documents. Um, you know, I, I'm always... I'm always hesitant to say that it's it's going to be 100% successful, um, especially when trying to get healthcare information. Uh, one of the chief complaints that I get from from families is is not being able, like maybe a person goes into state hospital and they have power of attorney, and the hospital won't give them any information. And the reason is is because even if you have power of attorney, you're trying to get information. If they can ask the individual, they're supposed to. Um, can I give this information out to your parent, who's your power of attorney? And if they say no. They still have to adhere to what John says because he's it's all he's ultimately in control of his personal information. But it does help you execute financial matters. It does help you give you a, a much better standing than if you're just say mom or dad. Okay. Other other alternatives that we can look at are you know representative payee. So you know if you if you're working with someone who has the ability to be financially exploited, maybe they give their money away. Maybe they overspend and don't have enough money to pay their regular household bills. A representative pay for Social Security is a great way to, to manage that because you know no one's going to be able to exploit someone where they won't be able to pay their bills. I mean, it can still happen with maybe their personal spending money, but you know at least that the rent will be paid, the lights will stay on, there will be food in the fridge. Um, so by appointing a representative pay, that can help prevent somebody from being exploited. And then the final thing is, is a special needs trust. Um, and we're going to spend our next section talking about what special needs trusts are and how they're how they're applicable um, and why they exist. Okay, so all right. So I'd like to unmute everybody if possible, and we can take some questions. Thank you, Jason. Uh, so we do have some questions coming in so far. Okay, uh, Jason, I, I want to be conscious um, for you to be able to go through the rest of your presentation sure. without questions popping up on your screen. Sure. Um, unfortunately, people can't just send questions to me. It's going to the presenter and host. So Jason, okay. if, if I could ask, there may be an option next to your chat box with the up arrow. Oh. And if you click that up arrow, it may say, um, it may say um, show chat preview. Okay. You click that so it unchecks it. You you shouldn't get pop ups throughout the session. So I do want so to be far conscious. Been okay. no, so far, we've been okay. They're not coming up on mine. Oh, perfect. Okay, great. Um, so we do have a few questions coming in. Uh, okay. Can you define the word incapacitated? Incapacitated is is effectively. So so it's 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 a legal term meaning that a, a judge has adjudicated you incapacitated to make decisions on your own behalf in whatever specific specific area that is, right? So meaning that if, if a doctor and actually two doctors have determined that you can't say manage money, a judge would adjudicate you incapacitated to manage your affairs related to your property, okay? So meaning your money, okay? And the same thing for whether it's both. If, if someone, let's say, um, if we want to get specific, let's say someone is, is nonverbal with a diagnosis of autism, they can't really communicate, um, they have a lot of care needs, um, you know, a, a doctor is going to evaluate that person and make a determination on whether that person can effectively execute decisions on their own behalf. That's what, it, so incapacity is a judge determining based on the evidence of two doctors that you are unable to govern your own affairs in whatever specific area. Okay, great. So we do have someone sharing that the concern that someone needs a guardian based off of making bad decisions um, is really not a reason to need a guardian. No, um, in fact, in fact, I, I actually, that, that I encounter that from time to time. Um, we do have um, some families that will call and, you know, maybe there's a substance abuse problem or something like that. And they say, I want to become the guardian because I want my child to stop drinking. Um, so there's really no, it's not about bad decisions. Um, and when, when an individual is being evaluated by a physician, they're doing a very specific, they're, they're doing, you know, empirically based tests to determine. It's not just they eyeball an individual and say, yeah, you can't really do that. They actually have to have, you know, some specific testing that they're using, utilizing 
um, because no one really corners the market on on good or bad decisions, right? You know, if, if it were just about bad decisions, there'd be a lot more people than you the guardian. Very um, true. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And then um, someone's also asking, can an IEP be used as documentation of when someone is applying for guardianship? It can be used as supporting documentation, but the, the statute is clear that you need two physicians to either create that guardianship situation. So you need two evaluations to, to obtain guardianship over someone, and you need two evaluations from doctors to get out of. I mean, that's that's the metric they use. I, I can't say I agree or disagree with it, but the, but effectively um, an IEP is helpful as is any documentation or, or supporting information or even, even a witness, but um, the doctor has to rely on empirically based testing to, you know, and, and a doctor's opinion on whether a person can or cannot govern their own affairs. Thank you. Uh, so, right, I think everyone on this call today recognizes that um, guardianship is a very personal, um, has to be well thought out decision right, that, that a family is making uh, with someone. But um, so we are not sitting here saying that everyone should have by all means, not sitting here saying that everyone should apply for a guardianship. Um, but what we are doing today is providing with the information that if guardianship is something that your family feels is necessary to explore, that you have all the right um, information in front of you and know what other questions that you need to ask as a follow-up. Um, and let's see, we have a few more questions coming in. Yeah, Melanie, just to, just to understand folks when I'm talking about guardianship, I'm not specifically a proponent of guardianship because it's not appropriate in all, all regions, all, all areas. And, you know, one of the things that I typically try and get families to avoid are what are called contested guardianships, whereas the individual themselves does not want a guardian or even more specifically doesn't want mom or dad to be their guardian. You ha really have to take the time to balance whether it's worth the potential struggle to your future relationship to, to do that. And that's why I also talk about those alternatives. It's not just because they exist, but, but sometimes, you know, if an individual just has financial problems, maybe it's not, you know, if they, if they can govern a lot of areas and in, in, in things, maybe you, you look for those supportive alternatives versus, you know, having a, a legal battle and testifying to your own child that you don't think they can govern their own affairs at the end of it, you may not be very happy with what's left of the relationship. So I typically, you know, promote, you know, least restrictive as possible. And if it can be done without going for a full guardianship, then great, you know, because, you know, maybe the person just needs support in the power of attorney area, healthcare proxy, rep pay and a special needs trust that protects all the financial stuff. And it gives that person support for decision making later on. There are situations where a person absolutely needs a guardian. I don't think that it's wrong to have it. But, but if there's a way to not do it, if a person has the wherewithal to fight it, you may want to consider those alternatives. Sure. And I, I think that, that it's great what you're sharing today, right? Is you're really putting all options out there for families to further explore. Absolutely. So someone's sharing, um, and I'm not sure if you're going to get to this further in your presentation. So if so, mm -hmm. let me know and I'll sort of table the question. Sure. I have um, a special needs trust, but how can I add a professional advocate to the appointed trustees. Okay, um, I tell you what, let's let's save that one for the end, just because sure. well, I'm going to talk about trust, and maybe they might want to modify that question. So okay. I may cover. If I am planning for my loved one with um, IVD to remain in our home, how can I? How can your organization support uh, this situation while at home? So, if we're talking about what's called self-directed services. Um, you know, if, if, if the plan is for that individual to remain in the home beyond when the parents are alive, um, that's going to be rather challenging. Um, you know, there's there's definitely I'd, I'd love to have a conversation with the person that, that, that posted that question. And, you know, and, and I want to at this point, I'll tell everybody that, you know, specific things are going to be harder to answer here. One, with the time we have allotted and, and two, um, certain there's there's a whole lot of other background stuff that you might have with your question that I'm not, not privy to necessarily. Um, if it's a self-directed question, I'd love to have a conversation with you, you know, off camera and, and we can talk about those things. But, you know, there, there are some things, some additional planning that you're going to have to do if you want to execute that plan. Um, because, you know, it's, it's one thing when, when mom or dad are living in the house, but what happens after that? 
Um, you know, we, we too have our limitations in that environment because, you know, it's not something that, that we offer where we can pick up and move to your house to supervise the day to day for your child. Um, and that's, that's one of the, the challenges that, that even DDD itself has not quite figured out yet. So, you know, there's certainly a conversation to be had. I just don't know that I can answer all those questions today. Perfect. And I uh, just to let everyone know at the end of the presentation, Jason is going to share the contact for Plan New Jersey, where they will offer additional specific guidance and support as needed for, uh, for families who have follow up questions to today's session. Jason, we have three more questions. Can we try to get to, to yep, the? Absolutely. Um, how extensive are the annual court reports for guardianship? Can your organization be listed as successor guardian? And how would one go about doing that? Okay, so the the core report, I'm gonna actually probably ask you to read it one more time, but core sure. reporting, it's not it's not that bad. It takes a couple hours to do. Um, what it is is it's 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 um, kind of a recap of the year. There's a small part, like a narrative where you're gonna talk about any changes that might have happened throughout the year. Um, it's it's making sure that individuals' taxes have been paid, that their benefits have been you know procured, whatever benefits they're eligible for. And then if you're oftentimes if you're if you're person and property, they're going to do what's called an easy accounting form, meaning what are all the income that the individual had and then what did you spend it on? Um, it's a lot of, um, there's actually a specific form that they give you, so they send it to you. Um, so it's really a fill in the blank form, if you will. Um, but that typically, it's it's an annual report, so it's done once per year. Um, again, it's, it's, not that, it's not that it's difficult, it's just you need to make sure it goes there. Um, like I said, mom and dad, they're not going to necessarily rile their cage, but any, if there's a cousin or even plan New Jersey. So we fill them out for every single one of our individuals. They're going to send us a letter if we don't send it on time. So ours is sent, you know, in a timely fashion to the surrogate court. So once that form's completed, it goes off to that surrogate court and then they file it away um, with the rest of the reports. So I actually have two additional follow-up yep. questions for that, uh, for the first part of the initial question is, what if a family has a loved one who is residing in a provider managed setting and that family has never filled out the guardianship form? And then where is that guardianship form found? Okay, so um, what we will do is we'll, I'll pop the website out. It's New Jersey, I don't, I don't have it off the top of my head. It's like New Jersey courts slash, but we'll pop it up um, in the chat box at the end. Um, I see that Melanie's on online so she can grab that and pop that up at the, the end of the, the, the seminar for us so you can can get that. Um, as far as with someone in a provide a, a provider managed setting, meaning like a group home or is that is that what you're saying or yes. Okay. And and what is specifically the question there? Um it is um let me just pull it up again. My son resides in a provider managed setting. I've never completed the guardianship forms okay. in the past. And and if it's a mom or a dad, they're not going to haul you off in cuffs, having not done it. Um, what I'm saying is, is that it's supposed to be done. It would be in the court. It would be in the court order saying that an annual report should be completed on an annual basis sent to such and such a court. Um, they actually now, I mean, again, if that guardianship was done a while ago, um, they weren't as proactive about ensuring that, but, but they typically put that in the order and where you can get the form. Oftentimes, the, the courts now give you that form and instructions on what to do and how to file it. Um, but like I said, we'll put, we'll pop that up. So this way everybody has access to it, um, can at least copy the website, um, to get the form if they need it. But again, when it comes to successor guardians beyond mom or dad, because the presumption is, is if your mom or dad, even the court realizes that maybe you don't necessarily need to do that report so much, but it's still a requirement. I highly recommend you do it. Um, moms or dads that don't do it. Um, for us, there would be, uh, you know, as an organization, it, it could be challenging for us to, uh, you know, to, to not complete the court required documents. And, and the reason why you have those documents, I just want to add is that even though you're mom and dad, when you're talking about an adult guardianship, you're still a representative of the court. Because um, what you're doing is because the court supervises adult guardianships, it doesn't mean that you know, it doesn't mean you're not mom and dad. It just means that you do still have to answer to the court if they were to request information or anything. Like that. Great. And can your organization be listed as successor guardian? And how yes. would one go about doing that? So that would be calling us. You know, what we typically do is we we walk you through, um, you know, a life plan. 
you know, getting all that information because I can only do a good job, as good of a job as, as the information you tell me, right? So what we typically do is we will, when you take that initial call, you'll actually speak with Melanie McQuell. Um, she'll set up a, a phone call for us to, to talk so we, I can get a little bit better situation, make sure that it's something that we can do. Um, I, I don't make promises if, I, if, it's not, if it's not something I can do a good job at. Um, not every situation for us, but is for us, but, but we can handle a lot of unique situations because we're not, we're not really tethered to any state organization. So, you know, us being a private nonprofit allows us to, you know, accommodate a lot more different needs. It's not that you have to fit specifically into our program. It's, it's whether we have the ability to, you know, to expand our, our ability to do things. Okay. So what, what you would do is it starts with a phone call. You'll speak with us. We'll determine whether it, it is a good fit for, for you and for us. And then if that's the case, we would complete a life plan. And then, you know, in the course of that life plan, we would identify all of those roles that we talked about today. Um, and, you know, we'd also create about a 25 page narrative laid out like a chapter book for all areas of life. So residential, medical, education, employment, um, legal, financial. So all the components that, that we talked about today. And then you would go into your will, you would, you would meet with your attorney and you would put us as a successor guardian. And in some cases, we're the first successor. Um, and then in some cases, I think the most we're like 14th successor in one family. Um, they have enough to like field a football team. Um, so we're 14th, you know, it's the just in case. And, and the reason why I say to have us as a just in case is because you lose your ability to make decisions if you run out of names on your list. So if you've identified two successors and both of successors predecease your child, well, John still needs a guardian and the court is still going to appoint a guardian. It's just not going to be anybody you select. So, you know, what our organization does provide is, is that longevity. So um, Melanie and I were just talking about this before is that, you know, one day I'm going to retire. So right now I, I serve in the capacity of director of social services. One day in the distant future, I will no longer be here, but the organization still will be, and someone will be in my role that can that can execute and you know execute that guardianship and make sure that your child is, is cared for. So that's the benefit of of you know having a successor be an organization because you know effectively it's infinite. You know, presuming that the organization is still around, which we're a very strong and healthy organization, so I don't foresee that being an issue. Okay, Great. hope that answers. Um, perfect. And I do want to welcome Melanie McGuell to uh, today's session also representing uh, Plan New Jersey. So you'll see Melanie is going to be popping up in the chat section. Um, I saw her just post the form. So thank you, Melanie. Um, so let's get to a couple more questions. When you're ready to move on, Jason, just let me know. Uh, okay. Can guardianship status be changed within a will? Example, if current guardianship is full, um, authority of person, property, can it be less restrict, less, I, I'm, just, I'm assuming less restrictive upon the death of the primary guardian? No. So any modifications to a guardianship have to go back to court. So you can, you can select who might be the successor guardian, but you can't change the terms of the guardianship because it's not, because remember, it's not the parent or, or anybody in that that's writing that will that, that had a hand in the guardianship other than being appointed the guardian. So the only people, the only power, the, the only person that has the power to create or undo a guardianship in the state of New Jersey is a judge. It's not even a doctor. You know, a, a doctor can do like a temporary hold on someone if they're in psychiatric crisis, but they don't have the ability to remove a person's capacity. So that has to go through a judge. Okay. And is it advisable to use a county surrogate guardianship mentor? Does Plan New Jersey act in the same capacity? And should a guardian slash caregiver use both options to help navigate guardianship? So I'm not familiar with that role. I'll be honest with you. That's the first time I've heard that. The county, what was that? The county guardianship mentor? County surrogate guardianship mentor. Okay. So what I'm assuming is, is that's a way um, just based on, I've, I've not heard of that role, but I'm assuming that's someone that can help you go through a pro se. Uh, meaning that you'd go through and, and adjudicate this on your own without the help of an attorney. Um, so that's what that sounds like. Um, some courts are more helpful than others when it comes to guardianships. Um, a lot of that is based on volume. So if you go into, 
you know, Mercer or Essex County, it's going to be a lot harder to navigate the Mercer or Essex County systems because there's just such a huge volume of people. Um, but if you go out to say Hunterdon County or even Somerset County, you know, there's a lot less guardianship actions, a lot less busy in the surrogate office. So they may be able to do a little bit more handholding. I will tell you, I've, I've been doing this for a long time. And, you know, honestly, if, if, if you have the resources to procure an attorney, I would highly suggest that you do that. Um, I'm not a fan of spending money on attorneys for no good reason, but this, this is one of those situations that it's helpful to have that guidance because there are certain timeframes that you have to do. Like you can't just get an evaluation and then a year or two later, then go for guardianship. There's certain time parameters that you have to adhere to throughout that process. So the, you know, the, the evaluation has to be within 30 or 60 days. Um, you know, there's certain motions that need to be filed. There's certain, there's just a lot of legal maneuvering that has to be done for a guardianship. So if the resources are available, I would highly suggest you utilize an attorney. Um, the process itself can cost you anywhere from two to $4,000 from beginning to end. Um, if, if finances are an issue, there's also the community health law project, which, um, which will do a flat fee guardianship. Um, as long as it's not contested. Um, there's another couple of resources, which um, I'll try and locate and I'll send them out to Melanie uh, to, uh, to, to make sure she has them. There's a couple of people that will help with preparing the guardianship stuff. I, I would highly suggest, you know, like I said, to, to utilize some legal services to, to complete that. Great, so let's get to one more question. I do sure. want to assure, uh, before we get to this last question, we're um, prior to Jason starting the second half of his presentation. If for any reason um, we don't get to your question today, I apologize, but know that Jason will sh uh, share Plan New Jersey's contact at the end of uh, today's presentation. And please feel free to reach out to Plan New Jersey with any additional questions that you may have. Jason, there's no fee for someone to reach out with questions. Is that correct? Absolutely no fee whatsoever to reach out and talk. Um, you know, so we, we luckily we're a nonprofit. So, you know, we have that ability to just provide some consultation to you guys. And, and even if you're not going to use Plain New Jersey services, I, that's, it's not a precondition that your expectations you're going to use our services. I honestly, the reason we do these presentations is to really level the playing field. There's a lot of families out there that just don't have access to this information. Um, there's no manual that you can pick up and say, okay, here's what I do. I have a child with a disability who needs a guardian or what is a special needs trust or any of these things. You really have to search for it. So, you know, we try and do as many of these seminars as we can in any given month. Um, so I, I just want to assure you there's, there's no charges to, to call us. We'll, we'll talk about things. And if it's, you know, if our services are something that are going to be beneficial to you, great. If not, that's okay. You know, I want to make sure that everybody's, you know, everybody's, you know, on the right path to, to making sure they have the planning done that they need. Great. Uh, and, and I know a lot of people are asking about a recording of today's session. Um, we assure you that we will send out that recording and any resources within the next 24 hours, um, 48 hours at the most, but we will make sure to get this to you as um, a resource for, for future listening. So last question before we uh, let sure. Jason move on. Uh, my son lives in New Jersey. However, I am a guardian through New York State Courts. I'm trying to transfer guardianship to New Jersey. Can I do this without an, an attorney? You may. I, I would reach out to the surrogate court um, wherever he resides in. I mean, I don't know all the circumstances be, behind that, but um, if you were formerly living in New York, your child has moved to New Jersey, and you're a guardian in New York, you, you just have to go to the surrogate court where... Um, where you, I would start with where you reside. If you're residing in New Jersey, um, that would probably be the best start. If not, then 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 the county where your child resides, and look at the idea of 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 doing that. Um, it's not like the guardianship is null and void. It's just you want to you want to make that transfer whenever possible, and and the court would be able to to help you with that. Um, you probably don't need to go through a hearing or, or restart the whole process. It's just a matter of, of reaching out to the surrogate court and getting their assistance. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you, Jason. So we'll let you move on and then okay. we'll hold the rest of the questions until the end. All right. Sounds good. Thanks. All right. So special needs trusts. Um, so let's start with the purpose of why a special needs trust exists. Um, when we talk about assets, um, most people, um, Let's say you're, I want to try and set an example because there's a thousand different ways that, that a trust can play out. But let's say the most common example is John, he's on SSI, 
he gets Medicaid, he lives in a, a DDD sponsored group home. Okay. That's probably the best general example that we can give. Okay. So the reason special needs trust exist is, is primarily because if the parents were to pass away and they leave John $100,000, all of John's benefits are going to go away. Okay, because Medicaid has what's called the resource limit. And for those that have already gotten into this process, they know it very well. But basically what it means is that at two thousand dollars, you've got more than two thousand dollars worth of assets in your bank account or in savings bonds or any type of asset. Um, Medicaid or rather Social Security says that you have too much money to be getting Social Security and therefore you can't have Social Security and your Medicaid that you're getting through Social Security goes with. it. Okay, so. That's what a means tested benefit is. It means that if you can have this benefit, if you don't have more than X dollars in resources, and that's that $2,000 limit. Okay. And that was set back in like 1984. I don't know what happened or why that still exists because things are way more expensive than what they were in 1984. Um, that said, by having a, a vehicle, what's called a special needs trust, you can have additional assets beyond that $2,000 that don't count against that resource limit. So you could have $100,000 in a special needs trust, but it still counts as a $0 asset. So if John has $1,000 in his checking account, $100,000 in a special needs trust, he still only has $1,000 in the eyes of Medicaid. Now they have to know about the trust, but they can't do anything about it. They can't say like, oh, you're not eligible because you have this other resource. And the reason for that is because the resource isn't actually John's. He's the beneficiary of that resource. He's not the owner of those resources. And what really sets that apart is, is that John does not have operational control over those funds. Okay. So it's not like John has a thousand dollars in his, his checking account over here, and then he's got a hundred thousand dollars over here, and he can get money out of either which one. It doesn't work that way. The only money that John theoretically would have access to is the thousand dollars, and the trust is managed by what's called a trustee. Okay. And because that trustee is there, they have sole discretion over the funds of what they're spent on. That doesn't mean John can't use them. Doesn't mean John can't benefit from them. It just means that the trustee has to be between the money and John. So if John needs a new TV, the trustee can purchase that TV for him, but they can't take the funds, give it to John for John to go and buy his own TV. That's pretty much the, the purpose of those trusts. It allows someone to have funds that otherwise would jeopardize their, their benefits, okay? So, and when we talk about what those things are that they could provide, they could be, you know, a personal care assistant, transportation, clothing, um, furniture, vacation, you know, all sorts of different things. And, you know, at the, at the end of the day, the, the major piece there is that there's a trustee between the transaction, the trustee making sure that it's an eligible expenditure and, you know, and then procuring that for John so that the money is actually sent to the vendor. Okay. So we have two different kinds of trusts. All right. And I want to try and make this as, as clean of an example as I can. All right. So we have John, which is our identified individual. Okay. And we have Sally, his sister. Okay. Mom and dad pass away. Okay. They didn't do any planning. And let's say they have, they sold their house and, you know, all of their assets, they had $200,000. So Sally, and they, they split it between both their children. Sally gets $100,000 and John gets $100,000. Okay. Sally is, let's say, neurotypical and she takes her money. Thank you very much. And goes and goes on vacation. Right. John, he gets his, his hundred thousand dollars. He loses all his benefits. He's going to get a termination letter from Medicare or from Medicaid. He's going to get a, a, a termina termination letter from Social Security. So the only way that John can undo that is by creating what's called a first party self-settled trust. So before we get into that, same example, Tom and Sally. So same amount, $100,000 each is going to them. But instead of parents did the planning and created a special needs trust, $100,000 to Sally, she takes her money. There's no impact. John, instead of getting the money, his inheritance goes to the 2022 trust for the benefit of John. Okay. And by doing that, he's not going to lose his social security. He's not going to lose his Medicaid. And more importantly, there's not going to be what's called a Medicaid lien on those funds. So one of the misconceptions out there is that Medicaid is insurance. Um, Medicaid is not actually insurance. Medicaid is actually a 
a lien on future assets, right? So if John were to have money when he passed away, okay, Medicaid would have first right of recovery. So in that same scenario, let's say John has $100,000 left over and, and it's not a protected asset and he passes away, they're going to go back and tabulate how much money Medicaid has spent throughout John's life, okay? And if he's living in a DDD residential group home, and let's say has a $150,000 budget, his Medicaid lien is probably two, three, four million dollars, okay? Which means Medicaid has a right to come in and collect whatever money he has when he's left over, okay? So when you have a third party trust, when the parents set it up, that gets rid of that whole scenario, that whole equation where there's a Medicaid lien that has to be repaid. That third, if you have a third party trust, same scenario, John has, they each get $100,000. And let's say John has $50,000 when he passes away, he still has $50,000 in his trust. Well, instead of that money going back to the state, that money can go to what's called an additional remainder, let's say his sister, Sally. So Sally now would get that additional money from that trust. There's no Medicaid payback provision. Now in the instance of a first party trust, so if you remember when I said that if Tom, if his parents did no planning, Tom gets $100,000, he can create what's called a first party special needs trust, okay, or his representative, okay, and, and what that would do is that's saying, John says, okay, I realize that I'm over-resourced, but I need my benefits for my housing and, you know, for regular income, so I'm going to give this money to a trustee, and that trustee is going to manage those funds for me, okay, and by doing so, it, it allows him to keep his benefits, so he keeps his Medicaid, he keeps his Social Security, okay, but what he's traded is he now has a Medicaid lien on that $100,000. So he's allowed to use it throughout his lifetime, okay? But when, when John passes away, at the end, Medicaid is gonna send a bill to the trustee of any funds that has, any funds that have been expended on John's behalf from the Medicaid program. So that, that DDD budget, you know, whatever the case may be. And that trustee is gonna have to send a check to the state to cover those funds. OK, they're going to actually have to send a check to Medicaid instead of that money going to Sally, that money goes to the state. And, you know, it's more than likely not going to be enough to cover his Medicaid, lien, but they will take all of it. And that's that's what a first party trust is. So if you don't learn anything from me today or, or heed my advice, creating a third party trust is definitely something that you're going to want to look into because. It, it, it basically keeps you from having to pay additional money back to the state of New Jersey in the form of a lien that you're not really required to pay. We're not required to pay off our children's Medicaid liens. It's not, not the law of the land. So therefore, you can put it into a third party trust and then set your additional remainders beyond whoever gets those funds from John beyond where, where uh, at the point at which he expires. Okay. So do you have a Excuse question? me, Jason. Yeah. I'm so sorry, to, and I don't mean to interrupt. I just want to make sure that you're on the correct slide. Um, I just want to see if your slides are advancing. Oh, I got two types of special needs trusts. So no, mine says, what are alternatives to guardianship? So are you telling me that this froze? Hmm. So yeah, so if, if you're comfortable, um, just clicking stop share. Okay. And then reshare your screen. Sure thing. Sorry, guys. Thank no, you for letting me know. A, not at all. Actually, Melanie was kind enough. Examples right. of trust distribution. Perfect. Right. There we go. Okay. okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. sorry. Thank you for letting me know. I appreciate it. Um, okay. So, so that's your first and third party trust. And I will tell you folks that, you know, again, this is again, why I tell you that if you want to have a conversation, there's about a thousand different scenarios. There's about a thousand different ways to get Medicaid in the state of New Jersey. And there's a thousand different ways your benefits might be coming in, whether it's SSI or SSD, or maybe a little bit of both. Um, you know, it's hard to encapsulate very specific situations. And that's, again, why we offer, you know, to have that conversation, because we can kind of talk about just about any type of situation um, and point you in the right direction. Okay. So let me put that up there just so everybody has a chance to see it. I know you guys are going to get a copy of this slide. Um, but that was where my example came from. All right. Um, all right. A pool trust. So what a pool trust is, okay, is is it's it's really a trust fund that's held by a nonprofit organization. It specifically has to be a nonprofit organization, and 
and we also offer that as as one of our um, one of our trust products. Okay, and and what it is is you're not having to go to an attorney to write what's called a private trust. Okay, what this does is allows you to join an already pre-existing trust. Okay, and by doing so, okay, you're you're not having to pay that attorney. It's something that you would sign a joinder agreement to to join the trust, but it does have some caveats and it is not for everyone. Um, the reason why it's not for everyone, because if we take that same scenario where, where we have Tom and Sally and Tom passes away with $50,000. So, so part of the trade-off of, of a pooled trust is, is that the, the administrator of the pooled trust is going to keep a portion of the trust at the end before it goes off to any remainder. So you know, Plan New Jersey keeps 50% of any pooled trust funds that remain and then would send off the additional remainders. There are some nonprofits that keep 100%. Um, that's just not what we do. Um, now, as far as things go, it is an option for folks if, say, maybe it's an only child, right? If it's an only child and there's no real, you know, remainders to have, maybe that's a good, good option for you. Um, but if you have several remainders beyond John, this is not going to be something that you want to do because you're effectively going to be making a charitable donation to, you know, to a nonprofit organization, and then the remaining funds would go. Um, same rules operate, you know, third and third and first party. So if, if, you know, if you have a first party trust and it's, it's a pool trust, you know, that still is going to go back to paying Medicaid um, rather than go to Sally. But, you know, they, there are the third party option. You just, you would want to make sure that you evaluate that with your financial advisor, your attorney, you know, and you would want to talk to us at, at length uh, as to whether this is the best option for you. So it does get rid of some of the front upfront costs of creating a trust, um, but it doesn't. It, it on the back end again, if you have those remainders, um, it, it could be something that you know may not be the most appropriate thing for you. Okay. Um, other examples of of trust distributions. Um, you know, treatment equipment, um, effectively anything that's not covered by Medicare or Medicaid. Um, so dental work, um, you know, an extra wheelchair if you need one. Medicare only pays for one, maybe every five or six years. Um, but if you need a spare one, you know, that's something that could, you know, it could be automobiles, um, you know, other types of tra transportation, Uber or something like that. Um, tuition, clothing, electronics. You can purchase a property with, with a trust. You know, the, the property itself has a lien on it. The trust is the lien holder. So that means if the property is sold, the money proceeds go back into the trust. Um, prepaid funeral costs. So, you know, there's some other options. And if we have that morbid conversation, I have, there's better things that you can do besides putting it into the special needs trust. Um, you know, and then effectively any insurances, cable, some utilities, um, you know, anything. I mean, even a cell phone, you know, a cell phone is considered you know, it's not really considered a necessity, even though we see it as that these days, you know, it's still considered a luxury item and things like that. So, you know, there's a lot of different things that you can do to help extend. And, and really that's what you're doing here, right? So when you're creating a special needs trust, you're creating effectively another entity of yourself. You're effectively cloning yourself. It's getting a new EIN and that those funds that you have will help allow to pay for things you know, for, for the rest of a person's life, even though, you know, obviously your child is, is going to likely outlive you, right? So, you know, one, one of the other things that I want to talk about when it comes to, to trust is, is that, you know, there's this idea that trusts are money and, and trusts are not money. Trusts are instructions on how to spend money. So there's kind of this misnomer out there that, oh, if you have a trust, you're wealthy. Um, that is not at all true. Um, you know, when it comes to, and in our last example, when we were talking about pool trust, you know, we have a minimum of $25,000, um, you know, for that trust, you know, that's, that's by no means considered wealthy. Um, you know, we do have some trusts that are significantly larger than that, but, but it's really, you know, the important thing here is that creating a trust does not necessarily mean it's, you know, this mass amount of wealth. It's, it's what it is. It's, it's protection of that money. Much like when we talk about guardianship, you know, you're talking about protect, protecting that individual. That's the same thing you're doing with trust with, with money when you create a trust. You're, you're protecting it with governing language that says this money can be spent on this. And that's it. And that's what really is the essence of why it's protected and why it doesn't count for Medicaid. It's not because the money exists. It's because of what its purpose is for and the, out, and the instructions that are out. Okay. 
All right, so let's talk about ABLE accounts and then we'll take every question that we possibly can. All right. Um, so ABLE accounts, you see 2014. Funny story, New Jersey didn't actually legislate this until maybe like 2018, 2019. Um, so what an ABLE account is, is, you know, when we talk about that resource limit, that $2,000, um, it's ridiculous. How can someone save for vacation if they have a disability or on Medicaid or on Social Security and they, if they get to above $2,000 worth of assets, they would lose their Medicaid. So how can a person, you know, save for anything, right? And that's, that's what this is the answer to, right? So what this does is this allows you to put money into a special account called an ABLE account, okay? Achieving a better life experience, okay? It goes to that ABLE account and it's placed in there and it does not count for Medicaid purposes. So when we talk about that, that $2,000 limit, let's say John has $1,000 in his checking account, his, his rep payee account, and he's got $3,000 in his ABLE account, he still only has $1,000 according to the Medicaid rules. Yes, he has $3,000 in his ABLE account. Yes, Medicaid has to know about it, but they cannot count it as a resource for the purposes of, of denying Medicaid, okay? So the good thing, right? So we have this, we have this place where we can put money, right? So if, if there's, if someone's getting to the point where they got like 18 or $1,900 in there and another social security check is on the way, John can, John or his representative can take that money and move it into an ABLE account to save it for a rainy day. Now he can keep saving money. Maximum amount is $16,000 per year. Okay. Can only put 16,000 in any annual as an annual contribution. And when you get to $100,000, which I've never seen it, so I have absolutely no practical idea of exactly the mechanism for that working. But if someone were to get to $100,000, they're going to turn off SSI. So you're no longer going to get that, that supplemental security income, but you still be eligible for Medicaid until the money comes back down below $100,000. Okay. Now, I have no idea what that looks like, because honestly, I've never seen it. Um, but the fact is, is that it allows you to save a substantive amount of money, you know, certainly can help an individual save for certain items that might be out of reach of the $2,000, but, you know, but it, it allows them to, to have the ability to save some money, which is something that everybody should be able to do. All right. Criteria is, is that you have to have a disability before age 26, right? There's no real checking mechanism, but it's something that, you know, if you have, if you're in DDD, well, you were, you have a proven disability prior to age 26 because DDDs is more stringent than that. You have to have a disability prior to age 22, right? Um, so, and then the other criteria is you can only have one ABLE account. So John can have this ABLE account with 3,000 and another ABLE account with 4,000, you know, and that prevents somebody from exceeding that $16,000 annual increase, okay? Other pieces of this that, you know, it's not the account gains aren't going to be taxed um, and they're not going to be, you know, distribution from it. So it's not like an IRA where you pull money out and you have to pay tax on it or anything like that, as long as it's for qualified disability related expense. And the list is exhaustive. You know, for the most part, just about everything is covered in, in distributions. You know, as long as you're paying for something with it um, that's even loosely related to a person's disability. Um, it, it's going to be, there's going to be no issues as far as taxes go. So this is the part though, that I really want everybody to focus on. An ABLE account is not an alternative to having a trust. Okay. And the reason being, okay, two reasons. One, an individual may have more direct access to an ABLE account. If they have a guardian, the chances are not. But if, if an individual say, um, doesn't require a guardian and is out living in the community, you know, has access to their social security account, is their own guardian, they absolutely have a right to have access to this money, okay? And, and that could lead to someone being financially exploited because they can go to the ATM and take out $800 a day effectively, right? Now, the other piece of this is that what you're doing when you're creating an ABLE account is that you are in effect creating a first party trust agreement with the state, meaning that any monies that go into that ABLE account, Medicaid has first right of recovery to. So John, with his DDD Medicaid lien, right? If, if mom and dad are putting money into that ABLE account, it doesn't matter where that money came from. Medicaid is gonna take it all the same. 
So that's why I want to make sure that everybody understands that by creating that, you're cre by creating an ABLE account, you're creating a first party trust agreement with the state of New Jersey. So you're then going to that money, if, if something happens to him, that money is going to go to the state to pay off his medicine. Doesn't, doesn't matter if you have a special need trust, doesn't matter because that's the vehicle that it's in. So it's good for a place, it's a great place for John's money if he's going to be over resourced. It's a terrible place for mom and dad's money. Mom and dad's money is best served in a third party special needs trust. So then this way it can make its way to Sally as a beneficiary if, if that's what ends up happening. So it covers that base. Any money that you put into the ABLE account will go back to Medicaid to pay off that Medicaid bill. Okay. So just to summarize, and I know that we talked about this before, you know, these are all the different roles that Plan New Jersey help with. We serve as successor, we serve as family support. So meaning that we're, you know, doing home visit monitoring and reporting back to the guardian and taking action that the guardian wants if they live out of state. Um, you know, we, we do a lot of life planning. We spend a lot of time doing life planning. We do home visit monitoring. So, you know, at, at the intervals that, that are appropriate to you. And, you know, the biggest feature here is that we cover the whole state. So, you know, our office is located in Somerville, which is center of the state. And then, you know, we have staff that, you know, cover effectively the whole state. So we have some folks, um, you know, we have a number of full-time staff and then we have some part-time staff, um, well-vetted, you know, our staff themselves have a minimum of a bachelor's degree and, you know, they're, they're well, very well-suited, um, you know, mid to late career folks, you know, so our staff, you know, are really second to none. So these are things that, that we can do. Um, and that's all I have for today, guys. All right. So this is our contact information. And, and ultimately, like I said, um, even if you're not going to utilize our services, please, by all means, feel free to reach out. I, I love to make sure you're pointed in the right direction. All right. And with that, I will take some more questions and we'll run out the clock on those questions. Okay. I'm sure we will. We have a lot coming in. All right. Sounds um, good. Great. So Jason, can you turn a first party special needs trust that is funded by a court order into a third party trust? You cannot turn a first party trust into a third party trust because the we, the reason where that money came from, okay, is why the money is in a first party or third party trust. Okay. So, so there's a couple of reasons how you can end up with a first party. So the first party is bad planning. So if mom and dad, the, the example that I gave with John and Sal, right? Mom and dad don't do any planning. John inherits money. Now he has to put money in a first party trust or he's going to lose his benefits. The other ways that he could get it is let's say he's an automobile, an automobile accident, right? So the insurance company can't pay a third party trust because that's not their money. It's not even John's money. They have to give the money directly to John. So if John's in an automobile accident, he's on Medicaid and, and social security, gets into that automobile accident. Insurance company says, we'll settle it for $50,000. His attorney says, great. Well, his attorney is going to now have to take that money and put it into a first party trust, okay? Because John can't have that money without losing all of his benefits, okay? And it's not uncommon, you know, I don't know if that's a question. I can't see all the questions, but it's not uncommon for people to have a first party and a third party trust, okay? The, the big issue there is that you, you pick which one you're going to spend first, and we're going to spend the first party trust first because that's the one that's got the payback provision. So a lot of our clients may have Mom and dad maybe put $100,000 in a trust for them in the third party sense, and maybe they have a $50,000 trust that's third party, but we're going to pay everything we can out of that first party trust to preserve the third party trust. Does that make sense? It does. And if that person has a follow-up question, please feel free to send that. Um, next question is, my 20-year-old son has a special needs trust for 10 years and qualified for SSI and Medicaid at the age of 18. His special needs trust was funded once upon the death of his grandparent before he received SSI. Why does SSI keep sending us notices every three months requesting our special needs trust statement stating we may no longer be eligible for SSI if the special needs trust is funded? Isn't that the point of having a special needs trust? It is, and that's a lawyer question. Okay. So I am not a lawyer. I am a licensed professional counselor, guys. So, <laughs> so I don't know why, and I'm really sorry that I don't have the answer to that, but, but technically, yes. He should, it should be protected if it, if it was a third party trust that was established and it was established before he was getting SSI, there might be a, some glitch in the system because ordinarily you don't have to create a, a third party trust prior to the age of 18 before you're getting SSI. So um, that might be throwing them 
into some sort of tizzy that they don't really understand. Um, so I would follow up with, I tell you what, you can call my office and, and we'll try and figure it out. And then if, if, you know, if I don't have the answers, then you unfortunately have to pay the lawyer tax on that. <laughs> so I'll try, I'll, I'll try and do my best. And if I have a little more information, maybe I can understand. All right. I can you talk a little bit about, again, um, how you can spend a special needs trust. Um, we have actually multiple people asking, like, can, can it be spent on clothing, shelter, food, um, or can you not? No and food. So the big thing, big thing with special needs trusts is they don't like food. Shelter, you can, but it's difficult, right? So if, if you're on SSI and you use a trust to pay for food and shelter, what you're going to get is called an in-kind support and maintenance reduction, right? So to get into that, basically, and, and I don't know if you have folks that are living at home. Um, if, you have, if you have folks living at home, um, more than likely, you're not even getting your full amount of Social Security, right? So if you have an individual who got Social Security, turned 18, but still lives at home, instead of the $684 starter benefit that they typically get, it's going to be something more along the lines of like $450 to $500. And the reason for that is because you as mom and dad are, are letting them reside with you and therefore providing what's called in-kind support and maintenance, meaning they don't have to pay rent. So the, the government says, well, we can reduce that by one third. Okay. Um, as far as, as far as, one more time on that question. I'm getting lost in my own sauce here. No, 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 that's uh, okay. Give me one second. I'm just going to be, I'm going to find it again. Hold on. I'm so sorry. No, you're okay. It's all me. No, I started, to I started to ramble. And when I start to ramble, I lost myself. Oh, here, actually, let me go back to my old questions that we just answered. Here we go. I'm sorry, Jason, for the way. No, you're okay. That was totally me because I kind of lost track of it. Okay. What does... where? Is, confirm if this was a question that we were on. Why does SSI keep sending us notices every three months requesting um, our special need trust statements stating we may no longer be eligible for SSI if the special needs trust is funded? No, not that one. I think it was the next one. Um, let's see. Special needs trust was funded once. Um, isn't that the point of having the special needs trust? That was that entire question. Were we on a different question already? We are. I apologize. I'm trying to read through all the other ones. No, I know there's um, lots. So I could see the, the yeah. chat. So this is what I'm going to say. If that was your question that Jason call me. was answering. Call me, I promise call I can answer that. You definitely answer that one. I, I, kind of, I kind of teetered off the, the, Not at the all. spot no, there. All right, it's fine, next question. Feel Terrible free stuff. to actually re resubmit the question um, and we'll make sure that that gets- I will, promise. Through. I'm so sorry. Don't be sorry. No, we're, we're good. Um, let's see. Can your services be paid with the DDD uh, budget? They cannot. So we are not a DDD, they, we are not a DDD vendor. So um, that is not something. So our, our funds are typically, our services are typically paid for out of special needs trust. So part of the, in part of the planning process, um, the parents are, are typically, if they're asking us to be guardian, asking us to be trustee, they're, they're formulating that into what their plan is as far as what they're funding the trust with. You know, so significantly more than what our fees would be. So our fees are typically, you know, to be guardian, they're, they're typically between three and $5,000 a year. Um, you know, when things are running smoothly, it's going to be at the, the lower end of that range. If, if there's, you know, medical psychiatric crises, you're going to be at the higher end of that range. So it breaks out to being about $300, $350 per month. Um, and that's inclusive of visiting, um, completing the guardianship report, any advocacy that's needed, response to crises, um, effectively doing our very best, even though I can't possibly duplicate you as a parent, that's you know having children of my own we we try and we try and duplicate that same role great and what are in-kind benefits and will these need to be reported to the irs and possibly make my son ineligible for medicaid 
Okay, so in-kind benefits is what we were talking about. So if you provide housing for an individual, Social Security, it's not going to make them ineligible for benefits. What it's going to make, as long as you're not giving them direct cash, but in essence, um, what you're doing is, is you're, um, you're providing them housing, you're providing them food, they're living in your house. So Social Security reduces the Social Security amount by one third. That's what we were talking about. And I found the question. So special needs trusts, I found it in there. Um, special needs trusts can pay for a lot of things. They just can't pay for food and shelter because what happens is, is it's going to create an in-kind support situation. Okay. So if you pay for, if you pay for shelter in particular, it counts as income. Okay. Because the way the government sets it up and that's what the benefit is for. When you talk about what social security, the, the, the essence of why it's there is to pay for food and shelter. Okay. Special needs trust for everything else. So if you mix, if you mix it, if you say, okay, well, you know, this person lives in the state of New Jersey, they can't pay rent. I'm going to pay a thousand dollars towards their rent. Well, the government looks at that as a thousand dollars worth of income. So that can actually impact and knock you off Medicaid on the County level. If your income goes above that. Okay. Or if you're, if you're getting SSI, it could be too much and they might take your SSI away for paying for that shelter because you're paying beyond it's no longer in-kind support. It's it's too much money that you're now not even eligible for Social Security because you're getting that cash income. So that's where you have to be careful. Um, but there's a lot of different ways that you pay for housing. If it's DDD, a lot of that's going to be covered under the waiver. So you're not paying rent or anything like that. You know what you're what you're effectively going to be paying is is one third. You know you, everybody who's under DDD services under the waiver and getting residential care is actually going to be getting a housing subsidy. So they're going to pay one third of whatever their social security, whether it's 800 or whether it's 1500, you're going to pay one third of your rent towards the group home. So the, the group home agency, the one that, that has the group home that's uh, providing the service is going to get a check from you for one third of whatever your social security is. And then they typically charge above and beyond that another 30 to 40% of your social security towards room and board. Okay. So it's, it used to just be when it, when it was, the CCW you used to have to send 75% of the social security back to the state. They've just changed the, they just mixed it around a little bit. And now you're sending it directly to the agency instead of back to the state of New Jersey. Great. So we have someone, if you have a third party special needs trust, why would you want or need an ABLE account? Um, it gives some flexibility. And quite frankly, because if you're getting over-resourced in the social security account, you can't. So when I say, that it's a great place for John's money. That's what I mean. So John, if John's living at home, you might have a third party trust or, or John just has a job and maybe he's got a small job and he's got a social security coming in and he's every month, he's like really close to that $2,000 limit in his checking account. Well, he can take some of that money and put it into the ABLE account. Okay. So a third party trust is your money as a parent. An ABLE account is the individual's money. Does that make sense? Okay, let's see. So we actually have a ton of questions coming through the chat section also. Um, so I see that we're out of time. What I am going to do is actually, um, I'm going to save the chat feature. So here, here's, here's my, here's my, uh, my offer. I can stay for longer. If you, if you have time, I can absolutely, I can absolutely try and answer these questions. Perfect. That's why we do this because I know that people have burning questions and I have to go, I have to go through my slides. You know, it's part, of the, part of the rules of the presentation. I can't just get on and say, all right, ask me questions. So um, I'll stay for as long as I need to. I, I mean, we could do this for another 15, 20 minutes, half hour if we need to. Okay. Perfect. Uh, okay. Jason, can I ask, can you put, do you have a slide with your contact information on it? Yes, I do. Perfect. I, I want to make sure that everyone has that before they okay. sign off. Okay. So if, you, if you're we'll comfortable just leave leaving this up. Yeah, Perfect. I'll just leave that up. Um, Okay, so I apologize. I'm actually just going through the chat section. I was really focusing on a question and answer section. So a lot of people seeing that. Thank you. A lot of thank yous. Wonderful workshops. All praise for you, Jason. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, <laughs> we'll forgive. We'll forgive me for getting what the question was. When I was <laughs> you, you got it. You I found it now. <laughs> um, so, is SSDI similar um, affected by like SSI by the Ebel account balance? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that one. But, but in effect, I mean, if you're on SSDI. 
it, it's, you know, it's, it's not, it, you, you still are eligible to have an ABLE account. Um, you know, it's, it's, I, I truly don't know the, I honestly, I've never seen anybody get up close to that maximum ever. It's not even, not even close because I, I, in fact, I don't want, I don't recommend that people do unless there's a reason. I mean, if you have a hundred thousand dollars in your able account, you should be getting some level of financial advisor or attorney support on that. Um, and use the money in the able account to, to, to do that effective planning. Cause you can, cause it's part of the qualified disability expenditure. Um, just because again, that's a lot of money to get back to the state of New Jersey. There's other ways that that money can be spent as far as I'm concerned. We have someone sharing that uh, her parents have never submitted a yearly report to the court. As a sibling, would I need to if my mom passes? You might. So when it goes beyond mom and dad, you know, and, and you become the guardian, I would highly suggest that you're ready to complete a guardianship report. So like I said, they, they have a tendency to leave mom and dad alone. Um, you know, their, vac their mechanism for review of the reports isn't exactly solid. Um, it's a volunteer program. Um, that each each court jurisdiction uses. So it's it's folks that have time. They come in, read reports, and try and flag anything that's you know not appropriate. And and that was really born out of um, you know there was some uh, funny enough. I mean a lot of a lot of times guardianship you know like 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 institutional guardians might get a bad rap. But but what happened and what was what it was born out of? There was one county where um, the court was supposed to be supervising guardianships. And when they did a, an audit, it turned out that there were some guardians that had sold property without going to court, um, which is something you're not allowed to do. So any major transactions, you have to go get court approval for. Um, and it turned out that they weren't collecting, reviewing, tracking those guardianship reports. So there was a big push maybe about five five years ago or so where they changed the whole system and, and started making everybody accountable to the system. I think they just had a lot of trouble you know, administering the program that they created, whether it's for lack of staff or whatever the case is, budget dollars, but, um, you know, be prepared to do it. Um, I, I would highly suggest that that you do them. That is my recommendation because one, it keeps it organized, um, you know, but again, mom and dad are going to get a free pass possibly, but brother, sister, and certainly Plan New Jersey is not going to get a free pass. We have to send them to every, for every client that we are guardian for, which is 47 individuals. Um, you know, we send them to every court every year uh, without fail. Jason, what does it look like, um, say that a family applies for guardianship in Ocean County and they move to Bergen County? Do they have to notify um, the Ocean or Bergen County court mm -hmm. system? Is, is there no. a process? No. Okay. no, not particularly. It's just that's where the, the it was adjudicated. In. You know, so if you were in Bergen, if you were in Ocean County when, when it was adjudicated, and that's where you're going to be sending your guardianship report to. But there's no, you know, as far as within the state, there's no issues. When you move from a state, yes, you got to notify when you get to the, the to the incoming state that that this guardianship, you know, I had guardianship in Bergen County, New Jersey, and now I'm in, you know, Orlando, Florida. You know, you're going to want to let Florida know that, you know, I have this guardianship and I'd like to transfer it, and they'll communicate with the court to. To make that work you don't have to re you don't have to relitigate the whole matter or anything like that it's just they, they need to know so then this way if you're operating within their state systems that you have a, a valid guardianship certificate within the state the reason for that is because guardianship is on the state level not the federal level um back to what i was saying with with contracts like credit card company cell phones there's no like there's no registry of people have guardianship so if you if an individual with their own social security number is to apply for something there's nothing that flags it and says, oh, this person has a guardian. They can't enter into a binding contract because it's not on the federal level. It's on the state level. Okay. Um, so we have someone asking if we are in the process of using a lawyer to update our wills and establish a special needs trust, mm -hmm. can we use your organization for guidance? Um, example, to ensure that the lawyer is doing things right and other services as needed. I can't say that I could oversee the lawyer to make sure that they're doing things right. I, I mean, for what you're paying the attorney, they should be doing things right. Um, but if you want to have a conversation with me, I can certainly help you streamline your conversation with the attorney to maybe save you some money. So no, so this way you can ask the right questions, make sure that the things are, you know, from my perspective, again, your attorney is your attorney. Um, so I would default to their advice. They're the one, you know, that, that, is, has the malpractice insurance that should be doing it the right way the first time. Um, perfect. Let's see. 
I see Melanie was offering some assistance in the chat. So thank you, Melanie. Um, thank you, Melanie. Does your organization offer income-based fees to create a special needs trust? As a caveat, how does a parent on a fixed income afford a special needs trust? Okay, so um, we, we do offer the community trust option. You know, that's something that is no fee. So you wouldn't have to pay whatever the attorney fees would be to create, because we're not attorneys. You know, we're trust, we're trust administrators, we're guardians, we're case managers. Um, you know, the trust themselves get either created by an attorney or there is that community trust option, which is effectively signing a, signing, signing a joinder agreement. There's no fee for, for that. Um, you're effectively joining a trust that already exists. Um, as far as funding trusts, you know, one of the best options that you can do is, is life insurance. You know, that's one of those things where for a relatively small amount of money, um, you know, a term life insurance policy could provide a little bit of a nest egg for, for somebody else in the future. You know, with money, you know, you don't you don't necessarily need that life insurance money while you're while you're alive. So that's a good way. And a lot of people fund special needs trust with with life insurance policies. Um, there's a lot of them out there that don't don't require a medical exam that are reasonably priced um, and can allow you, you know, for 20, 30, 40, 50 dollars a month um, to, to leave aside some funds, um, even some substantial funds for that amount. That's typically what I say, because we're not we're not all wealthy. I know I'm not personally wealthy. So, you know, my family's protected by life insurance, right? So I, I apologize if we're duplicating some questions, but I want to make sure that we're addressing some of the specific um, portions of, of some general questions we already asked. Uh, can local night nights out, such as dinner and show, be covered by the trust? Um, to some extent, yes. I mean, there's a little flexibility when it comes. I mean, food is really a no-no. But if it's part of a greater activity of like a dinner and a show, you know, that's, you know, if you're going to medieval times, that's covered, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you know, again, when we're talking about groceries, no, you can't use a special needs trust for groceries. But what you can do is take all the things out of someone's budget that they're paying for in Social Security and, and pluck out all of the things that the trust can be paid for, which is going to help increase the person's personal spending where they can go and go to dinner. OK, so that's where you pay that cell phone, you pay that, you know, you pay that cable bill, you pay, um, you know, the Uber fees to, to this place or that. And that's three hundred dollars right there, you know, because cell phones are ridiculously priced these days. So and that will pay for that dinner night out. So a lot of it is creative budgeting. And that's why we do, you know, in-house, you know, we're trustee, but we're also rep payee for a lot of our, our trust folks because we have the ability to kind of pick and choose what we're paying to increase the budget when we need to, you know, that social security budget. Okay. Um... Can you talk a little bit if someone has, I know that we did already address this um, somewhat, but if someone has a first party special needs trust um, that there is um, some additional restrictions or, or penalties, right? Once that individual passes, mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit um, more about the benefits of possibly opening a third party trust in addition sure. to the first party? Sure. So, I mean, the third party, again, when we're talking about a first party, that means that John own the funds, whether they were through a direct inheritance, because when you pass away, it doesn't matter that, you know, your executor hasn't settled your estate or anything. It matters that you passed away and instantaneously your inheritance are now owners of whatever share of your estate is, whether it's $50 or $500,000, they're, they're whatever their share that's outlined in the will. So as it pertains to a first party trust, you don't have to, the money doesn't have to go to John. That's why you create that trust and make it a third party. That protects your assets. As far as a first party trust, there's a lot of regulations because Medicaid has a chip in that game. They want to know what you're spending that money on. Very specifically, you need approval for any, any expenditure over $5,000 and they have the right to approve or deny it. So if you want an automobile, and paying paying for it out of a, the, the difference between the two. If I have a third party trust and I have to buy a Honda Accord, which are now ridiculously priced now, so what, like twenty five or thirty thousand dollars, right? 
I, if I have a third party trust, I can write the check and that person has a vehicle. That's it, done. If I have Medicaid, if I have a Medicaid payback trust, that first party trust, right? I have to get Medicaid's permission, get their approval. You know, they'll send me a letter saying that it's okay to purchase that vehicle. And then I can go and purchase that vehicle. I don't know how long that approval can take. Sometimes it can take a week. Sometimes it can take a month. It's when they get to it. So it gets between the individual's needs and their money. So I, I really, really, really stress whenever possible not to do that. And sometimes they'll deny it. I, I had one instance where um, we had an individual who lived alone um, and his power kept going out where he was at. So on his street, you know, he had like three or four power outages, some that were for like two days and it was getting to be a safety issue. So, you know, he wanted to get a generator put in the house and we said, that's a great idea. So generator cost like eight or $9,000 because it was a large enough house, but it was an automatic generator. So it wasn't something that I had to go and flip the switch when it, the power, or he didn't have to do that either. So it would just go on when his, when his uh, power would go out. I think it was eight or $9,000 and Medicaid denied it. So they said, no, you cannot get that. That is not a necessity. So he can go stay in a hotel if that's the case. So lucky for him, he had a third party trust and we were able to go get it out of the third party trust and pay for it and done. So that's, I think that's probably the clearest example I can give you on why you want a third party versus a first party. Perfect. Um, and Melanie, I apologize. As I'm typing, uh, I'm just messaging Melanie, asking her to repost the PDF. She was posting it. So I do want to uh, direct everyone to the PowerPoint slides that Melanie Miguel um, had posted in the chat section. So you can go to that PDF and actually open or download that PDF and save that for your convenience. And again, we will definitely be sharing a copy of this recording um, for your future viewing pleasure. And feel free to share that with anyone else that may benefit. Um, expect to see that within the next 24 to 48 hours. If you have specific questions, please reach out to um, Jason at Plan New Jersey for uh, specific guidance or information as needed. His contact is still on the screen. So quickly take out those cell phones, take a quick snapshot, screenshot of that, or uh, download the PowerPoint. Uh, that Melanie just posted, and we'll make sure um, to get you a copy of the PowerPoint in the recording um, email that you'll receive hopefully by tomorrow. Jason, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate all, all the time that you spent. All positive. I'm actually even getting emails already um, with thank positive God. feedbacks coming thank through. So and thank Melanie, you so if you much. Want, I still have more time if you want me to keep answering Let's questions. See if we got phone. new ones. Let's see. If we I'm fine. I don't. I hate. I don't. Let, I. I can't stand it when people have questions and they don't get them answered. If they. If they came and sat and listened to me ramble on, I, I would love to answer any, any amount. Like I said, I can. I can go to till to two o'clock. That's that's Perfect. fine. I don't have another meeting until after that. Okay. Okay. Great. So Melanie, Bye. if I can ask you to repost um, the PDF one more time and just make sure that it's being sent to everyone, um, that would be great. And that'll be in the chat section that Melanie was able to post that for us. Melanie, I have, I've actually posted it three times, but people are still saying they cannot see it in the chat. Okay, let me just take a look real quick. So Melanie, if you go up to the blue box, I don't know if it's being sent to everyone or just host and panelists. Those are my, that's my only option. Okay, so let me. That's why it's hosts and panelists. I apologize. So no, that's okay. So I, is everyone getting a copy of this PowerPoint? Whoever's on this? I will be sending it out, okay. absolutely. And okay. what I'll do is make sure that I send that in tomorrow's email for everyone. So you're gonna wanna look for an email that's gonna come from Rutgers Community Living Education Project. And through that email, we'll have a copy of the recording and the PDF for everyone also. Okay, let me just go in the chat and make sure that everyone's... Melanie, can you try it one more time? I just changed settings. I apologize. Oh, I see. Okay, now I can just select. Fantastic. Perfect. Right, sometimes when we, want, when we want something, we want something then, right? There we go. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Melanie. Terrific. That's great. Okay. So let me just, I'm just scrolling through the chat section again. Again, I apologize as new chats are coming in, it sort of scrolls everything up. 
um, that hasn't been addressed. Okay, let me take a look. Someone's saying that their question was not addressed yet. So my son gets disabled adult child benefits from social security. Do the same rules apply um, as it applies to SSI? Um, well, I mean, uh, yeah, that's, I, I, that's almost too broad for me to answer. I mean, it's a different program. And just so everybody knows, disabled adult child benefits are happen when an individual has been getting SSI and then a parent either passes away or retires. And what that means is, is that they're entitled to 50% of the highest earning parent's social security. So an example would be, let's say uh, mom's working and her social security benefit is $2,000. The child is on you know, SSI, so he's getting $684. Um, and mom retires, so they get, you know, since mom gets $2,000, the child, the disabled adult child is eligible for $1,000. So that child is no longer going to get SSI and they're going to, they're going to start on, on social security benefits. Okay. And it's, it's similar to social security disability. Okay. And then what happens is, is that child who's now on disabled adult child benefits and getting the thousand dollars actually 18 months, 18 months later can now apply for Medicare, which is insurance, you know, whereas Medicaid is not insurance and is a lien Medicare actually is, is insurance and it covers 80% of all of your medical costs at Medicare's contractual rate. And then if you have Medicare and Medicaid, okay, Medicaid will act as your supplement to that Medicare. So meaning that, you know, that Medicaid will pick up that 20%, okay? And it reduces the amount of your Medicaid lien for one, which is great. Um, but it, but it further, you're going to have better access to doctors because if you want to be a doctor, you need to take Medicare. So... Okay, and why are gains in the first person special needs trust taxed and gains in an ABLE account are not taxed? It's hmm, a good question. It'd be a good question for the IRS. I honestly, I truly don't know. I mean, that, you know, in, in our legislators and all their wisdom have decided that, you know, just because someone has a trust, they supposedly have money. Um, they're all kind of lumped in. So trust, so whether you're a first party or a third party, you're going to get taxed on any income on the trust. You're not getting taxed on the principal, but let's say you have $100,000 in a trust, whether it's a third party or a first party, it's all taxed at the same rate, um, which is one of the higher tax rates, um, whatever, probably the highest tax rate um, on the income. So, you know, if you have $100,000 and you make $10,000 in income on the trust, you're going to pay $3,000 in tax on that set or on that 10 roughly. So, but I, I don't know why. I mean, maybe they, maybe they look at the ABLE account as more product specific to the disability community, but I, I honestly, I don't know the full answer to that. Jason, can you describe your process for developing a life plan? Sure, absolutely. So what, what we typically do, it starts with a phone call. So we're going to talk, we're going to get to know each other a little bit. I'm going to know what your situation is. Is it something that's within the scope of what we do? Um, we can help most people. We can't help everybody. I mean, there are some situations that, that we just, we, we, I can't tell you that I'm going to do a good job at it. So I'm not going to tell you to do it. Um, but, but after that conversation, we kind of make some determinations. Um, you know, if, if it is something that we're going to proceed with and, and write a life plan and maybe serve in a, a trustee role or a home visit monitoring role or a guardianship role, um, we'll start the life plan process. And what that is, is we send you out a packet of information, um, a lot of name, rank, and serial number type stuff, um, you know, doctor's names and addresses, important people in an individual's lives. Um, I'd say that's probably about 15 pages of documents. You fill those documents out, you send them back to us, and then we send a, we schedule an interview. Uh, we have a, about a two to three hour interview, depending. Um, and it's every question that we've come up with that's necessary for me to ask you everything from someone's favorite color to what happens if somebody gets bad news at the doctor how do you want to handle that situation um and the reason for that is because the idea of us being guardian is not that i'm the individual's guardian it's that i'm executing your wishes as a parent 
Um, I think I make good decisions. I think I have good values, but that's not the point. The point is for us to get to know you well enough that if we're faced with situations, I know what mom or dad would do. So that's what the process looks like. So once we're done with that interviewing process, um, we put all that information together, the information that the parent has sent us, and then uh, whatever, you know, from the, from whatever we garner from the interview, typically you end up with about a 20 to 25 page narrative of the individual. So and it's laid out like a chapter book. So it's got an introduction with all the key contacts for, for that individual. You get into the residential section of what is their current residential situation? What do the parents want to see in the future? And then you go into employment. Where they where did they go to school? What were early signs of you know issues? Um, where have they worked? You know what are what are the job relationships like? And then from there, you know you get into social. What does the person like to do by themselves? What do they like to do with friends and family? You know just all the information that we can possibly garner, so I can make informed decisions with your child. And is that a process that you work through only with families who are going to be um, going through Plan New Jersey for guardianship? Or is that a process that a family can go to you for just to um, have documented? I mean, it, it, it's not something that we've done. I mean, typically we do it with families that we're going to work in the future. I, I, I haven't seen a situation where it makes sense for us to do it for a family that's not going to utilize our services. I I have no vested interest in charging anybody for things. I can, if someone's just, if someone is doing the things on their own, I can tell them what to do as far as what they want to do life planning. Okay. You know, that's something that's for us because if I'm making a promise to a person um, that's not going to be here when I'm doing my services, I have to make sure that I, you know, ultimately understand that our under, our, our you know, why we do what we do and why we're as thorough as we are is because you're, you're, I'm making a promise that you as a parent can't enforce because you're dead. It really ultimately, and it's and it's so it's it's very important that we do the life plan when we're we're doing this service and we're agreeing to do that service. That's why we're very why we it's an imperative if we're going to be guardian because I want to make sure that we're doing all the things we possibly can to make sure we're adhering to what you would do as a mom or a dad. But if someone just wants to write a life plan, I'm happy to have a conversation with them and I can tell them kind of what the pieces are that that they need to do and what they would want to include in that to, to share with their family members that are going to be future guardians for them. Great. And is there a fee if you, if, if you're um, written into, into someone's um, future supports in regards to providing guardianship? So is but, there an, an ongoing fee? Yeah. Is there an ongoing fee prior to you actually having right. to assume that role? Just when we do a life plan. So that's actual work that we do. It's it's a lot of hours. It's a lot of people involved in writing that plan. Sure. Um, but there's no like membership fee that's ongoing or anything like that. We only, you know, a lot of a lot of families, and that's typically what happens in our planning process, which is, you know, we will meet a family, um, we'll write a life plan, you know, and then we may not hear from them for 10 years. You know, it's something that they wanted to get done. They wanted to get that that information memorialized. Um, I highly recommend that that they ring my cell phone. You know, once once they have written a life plan, I encourage families to call me at least once a year. Um, not because I need to charge you a fee, but just to see who answers the phone. If it's not me, then you should probably get to know the person who picks up my phone because they're they're going to be in a decision making role for your child in the future. Perfect. And how often are families encouraged to update the life plans? Right, uh, understanding someone's needs may change. Um, so, yep. So we used to we used to say you should update it every two years, and we used to send send information out and mailers and all of those things, and we didn't get a very big response. So we ultimately leave it up to you. If you need to update it every six months, you're absolutely welcome to. If you want to update it every year, or if you want to never update it, we, we leave it in the parents' hands. So we don't have like a, a, a minimum or a maximum times you need to update it. What we what we do do is not charge for updates. So when we write the life plan, the, the fee is the fee, and that is there's no additional fees for it. Um, when you're updating the document, because we know it's something that's going to change. We expect it to change. We want it to change, right? So, and we know that going into it. Um, so because of that, we don't charge you for those, those updates. So it's not like, it's not like with your will, every time you go in and you update your will, you're going to get an invoice. That's not how it works with us. If someone's, uh, um, if someone's child has disabled adult child benefits says the two thousand dollar maximum also apply this person needs to apply for medicaid benefits for her separately each year yes yeah, so 
No, the $2,000 maximum is not going to apply for social security. Okay, but the $2,000 maximum is going to apply for Medicaid because when you have disabled adult child benefits, and let's say you, you are now above that SSI limit, you're not getting SSI anymore. So you have to apply for Medicaid through a different way. And it's the most typical way is through the count. So when we talk about Medicaid with SSI, that's federal Medicaid. When we talk about you know Medicaid for someone that's getting, let's say SSD, that's actually derived through the county. So whatever county you reside in, Mercer County, Somerset, whatever the county is, you're gonna go and make an application for Medicaid. So you do have to stay below that resource limit to maintain your Medicaid, yes. Okay, and can you address the Medicaid application and relating to the ABLE account? I mean, in terms of the ABLE account, they know they exist. It's not something they can count. So just like a trust, they're entitled to see both the copy of the trust agreement and the statement of the account. So if you have $100,000, you're not hiding, remember, you're not hiding the money from Medicaid. You're notifying them that it exists. So they have the right to ask for the trust document to make sure the language conforms with what they require. If not, you may be required to rewrite it, which is also the importance of when you're doing these things, going to an estate planning attorney specifically. You can't go to a generalist, like a, a lawyer that, that practices, dabbles in criminal, dabbles in real estate. Like you need a specialist because you don't want to have to rewrite it. If you're going to pay a couple or, two, or a few thousand dollars to have a trust written, you don't want to have it go to Medicaid when, when it's, you know, when after you pass away, because now we're going to have to have the trust rewritten um, to conform with the Medicaid language. Okay. But as far as an ABLE account, you would just need to send in a, a statement, whatever the statement is of what's in the ABLE account. They're entitled to know about it. They're not entitled to count it. We have someone from the earlier from the question earlier who wanted to offer some clarity. Um, since I wanted to clarify that um, I was referring to county surrogate monitors, not mentors. In my earlier question, that was the typo. It is beneficial. Um, is it beneficial to have a county surrogate monitor working with you if you're working with Plan New Jersey? I honestly don't know what that role is. Okay. I'm almost embarrassed. I've never heard of that role. Um, so it's it not somebody be... that I interact with. It's not somebody that I would interact with um, on a regular basis. Um, I mean, if we're talking about, you know, every, I mean, every once in a while, if I'm trying to think, I don't think I've ever come in contact, but I am going to look it up after this, after this presentation, just because I'm not sure what that role is. And it may be specific to even one county, right? It may be. Um, it may be. And so I, you know, curious, curious to learn more. I am very curious. I, that is one thing that I learn. I learn stuff all the time, you know, with, with Medicaid. And that's, again, one of the reasons why we do this, because it's not a user-friendly system. I, I do this for a living all the time, and we still learn new things because there's not, they don't have this set path of here's the information, learn it, and now you know it. Um, there's a lot of turns in the way, and that's, again, why we do this. Okay, but I am going to look that up. Perfect. Um, let me just, I did see one more question in the chat, so I apologize. Let me get back to that. Um, is a special needs trust the same as an irrevocable trust fund for burial services, so, uh, such as choices, such as a choices account? Okay, so those are two different things. And actually, it was funny because I was saying that, you know, you can pay for a funeral out of special needs trust, but the better the better vehicle is a choices account. And what the choices account is, is it's, it's effectively, it has the same, it, the same effect. If you put, you know, $10,000 in a choices prepaid burial account, it has the same benefit of not being counted as an asset for Medicaid purposes, but it's very specifically for burial. So, you know, let's say um, you're doing your own funeral planning and you decide for your disabled adult child, you're going to do their planning at the same time. If you were to just pay prepaid a funeral, you pay the funeral. And that's actually an asset. As gross as that sounds, a plot in a cemetery is considered an asset and it's a deeded property. So what they do is, is you're, you're creating a funeral contract with a, with a servicer and they, they have to be with that, participate with the choices program. And what happens is, is you create that agreement and then the monies that you pay actually go to the state of New Jersey to, to monitor those funds and make sure that they're there at the time the funeral happens. Okay. And the reason for that is because uh, many years ago, um, what used to happen was you used to give the money to the funeral director and 
one of the funeral directors ended up in Mexico with like $750,000. And, you know, unfortunately, those people that had money with them couldn't recover it. So because several of the states stepped in and said, OK, if we're going to do if people are going to prepay these funerals, we're going to create a trust and that money will always be held for that person. So this way, if a funeral home goes out of business, the burial can still be paid for. And the second part of that question is, can special needs trust funds be utilized in the event an individual passes away suddenly? Yes, they can. A third party trust can. Okay. A first party trust, Medicaid gives problems. And yet one more reason, one more reason that you want a third party trust as opposed to a first party is, is that Medicaid doesn't really allow you to have any normal customary things that we would have. Like you can't have prayer cards, you can't have flowers because they're no longer for that individual. It's kind of gross. That's the explanation for that is that the person's dead, so they don't need flowers. So that's the explanation we're given. So yeah, so if you have a third party, you absolutely can, can pay for those services. Okay. Plan in advance, right? Um, Jason, thank you so much. Greatly, okay. greatly appreciate your extra yeah, time, pleasure. your expertise. Um, again, everyone, Jason's contact is on the screen. Please feel free to reach out with any additional questions that you may have. Um, additionally, look for the email that will be coming from Rutgers Community Living Education Project with today's resources, recording, PowerPoint, so on. Um, we thank everyone for joining us today. We hope that you join us for future sessions. In tomorrow's email, you will also see a link to take a brief survey for today's session. So we encourage you to do that and offer any suggestions of additional topics that you may want to hear on. It's information that we receive from you that allows us um, to plan for future information sessions. So thank you everyone for joining. Jason, Melanie, thank you again for all your time and support. And we Thanks will see everyone soon. Absolutely. And like I said, my offer still stands. If anybody didn't get their questions answered, please feel free to reach out to us. I'd love to, you know, like I said, keep you pointed in the right direction. Okay. All right, folks. It was great. Bye -bye. Thank you again for the Bye. feedback. Be well. Bye